We're turning this morning in our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 4, and we will begin reading in verse number 1, book of Genesis, chapter 4, and verse number 1. It's good to be in God's house. Thank the Lord for his presence. I understand there are some that are uh, predicting a big storm next week, and so we'll play that by ear. As of now, the plan is, of course, to have church. We always plan on having church. And if we can certainly get here and the roads are passable, we will. But we'll keep you posted. Let's just pray for good weather. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, if we could stand for the reading of the word. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? And this is, verse 7 is where I'd like to call your attention this morning, my subject. The Lord was reasoning with Cain, and he said, If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee, unto sin, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Sin lieth at the door. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about this concept that we have in life. Repercussions. Repercussions. To everything that you and I do, there's a repercussion for that. There's a there's a quid for every pro quo, as we've heard in the news a lot in the last couple of months. There's a ying for every yang. Amen. So today we want to talk to you from this particular portion of Scripture. Let's lay our Bibles down and lift our hands, and let's ask God to help us to open our hearts. Would you do that with me, Father? We've come to the most important part of this service today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. For those that were here early this morning practicing, those that were working around the church yesterday and last night, and good time of prayer last night, Lord. And God, we believe you for great things to happen in our service this morning. Let the Word of God impact somebody's life today help somebody today to receive what it is you have for them speak to us fill somebody with the holy ghost let someone be baptized in your name today in jesus name everybody said amen you may be seated as i've been announcing this year i'd like to ask today that there be uh, no electronic devices out and being used you do not need your electronic devices for scripture We've solved that problem for you. We have the scriptures. They'll be on the screen in front of you. So there's no need for you to be using your electronic device at all, period. And if you have it out, we're just going to assume that you're being rebellious and just having it out just because you have a bad spirit. And so um, that will, of course, be a strong indicator of, of your spirit. Please put it away and uh, please let's pay attention to the word of God. We shouldn't even have to talk about that, but we do. We do. You would think people would just automatically respect God's house, but it's a problem not just here. It's a problem in every church, and the pastors everywhere are really having to crack down on that. There are some schools now that when you come to class, you have to put your electronic device in a safety bag and keep it there. I heard on the news last week, Thursday, I was in the car, and they said that now teachers are uh, having problems with that, and kids are suffering from um, separation anxiety from their electronic device, separation anxiety. And so what they're doing is rewarding kids that have their phones put away and they're able to focus. Uh, they're rewarding them by dropping their lowest grade. So they're incentivizing children by saying, if you put your phone up and, and pay attention for 30 minutes, we're going to drop your lowest test grade. And they said that the, the, the parents are just excited that the kids are having great scores. Amen. We're dumbing things down for our generation. 
And uh, everybody's a winner. Everybody's a winner. And everybody's passing because they put the phone away for 30 minutes. When we come to God's house, that ought to just be a no-brainer. Amen? Amen. Now, when we read in Genesis chapter 4, Moses, the writer of the Pentateuch, gives us a glimpse into this principle in life repercussions. This is something that we all are familiar with. We may not walk around and call it repercussions. We may not have that moniker on it, but it's a principle that we are all familiar with as far as there's a, an effect for every cause. There's a cause and effect. When we look up the word repercussions in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and I looked it up briefly this week, it means reverberation, a reciprocal action or effect. So if you go to the Grand Canyon and you stand down in the Grand Canyon and you holler your name, it's going to bounce back at you. It's going to echo back and forth as those sound waves bounce back off of those, uh, those stone walls. There is a reverberation. Repercussion also means widespread, indirect, or unforeseen effect of something done or said. Now, we're all aware of this concept, repercussions of actions. For example, we all understand that if we don't get up and go to work tomorrow, within a few days, there's not going to be a paycheck. Unless you've got some PTO that you can use, some personal time off, and that's always a nice thing to have. But even then, that PTO, using that PTO is going to have a repercussion because there may actually come a time when you would need that PTO and you're not going to have it to use because you used it tomorrow. So say, for instance, you have five days of PTO this year and you would take in a, a, a vacation in June or July, but you take it tomorrow because you're sick or you're just not feeling well or there's something going on, then you'll have to cut your vacation short this summer because you've used your PTO tomorrow. Amen? There's a concept that we're familiar with. If you don't work, you don't get paid. If you do work, you get paid. If you are in a particular profession where you have to stay on the learning curve of that uh, profession and you don't do it, then that profession is going to pass you up somewhere along the line and you're going to wind up being outdated in your profession. I had to go Saturday before last, Saturday but a week ago, I had to go to a continuing legal education seminar. I would rather have my tooth pulled than have to sit there on a Saturday for nine hours and listen to... Uh, you know, what's going on in the profession and how we can stay updated. But I do understand it's necessary. And I can imagine someone that did not go to one of those things. It's required and we have to do it or we lose our license. But I can imagine someone that did not go to one of those things for 5, 10, 15 years. And they would wake up one day and be outdated. All the policies would have passed them up. All of the procedures would have passed them up. And so it's important that we stay on that learning curve. We don't stay on the learning curve. We don't stay up to date. We don't have a future in that particular profession. Most of us are familiar with the concept of investing. Benjamin Franklin said the most powerful force on the planet is the power of compound interest. If I was here today and I was in my 20s, I would start investing right now. Amen? And I'm not in my 20s anymore. I'll be 48 next month. And uh, I, of course, put the church first when we came here and, and just recently started putting away for retirement. And I'm way, way, way behind, but hopefully God will let me live long and I'll be okay. But if I had my druthers, if I was smart about it, I would have started when I was in my 20s and been able to, to do that uh, successfully. But, you know, there's a lot of folks that don't save and they wind up at retirement age and there's nothing there except Social Security. And again, if you're in your 20s and you're banking on Social Security, I've got some land I'd like to sell you in uh, Paris, France, right around the Eiffel Tower. Come talk to me after church and we'll discuss it. I'm not banking on Social Security being here. You say, well, Pastor, that's negative. Well, it may be negative, but I think it's realistic too uh, with all the talk that's going on about the current uh, situation going on in our Social Security. And I'm not being, trying to be a fear monger. I'm not trying to be negative. If you're here today and you're, you're receiving Social Security income, that's great. We're, we're thankful you're able to. But I think the generation coming up would be prudent to not try to bank on that because of the current financial condition our nation is in. Somebody say amen. 
But if you begin investing now and you begin being prudent and cutting corners and not buying that third cup of Starbucks coffee every week and maybe uh, not getting high grade gas, maybe the next level down and clipping some coupons out of the out of the newspaper and and trying to cut some corners and save some money and you compound those savings over a period of time it could really be substantial there are repercussions for being prudent and being frugal and of course the flip side of that is true there are repercussions for not being prudent and not being frugal amen for instance if you do not start saving now and you do not start investing now, then when you turn 60, 62, 65, 70, and you're beginning to opt out for Social Security, then you won't have anything to help you with that. Amen. When it comes to budgeting, and again, I'm not talking about natural stuff today. My, my goal is to get to the spiritual ramifications of repercussions, but let's just kind of deal with some things that we're familiar with. How many of you, when you go to the grocery store, you have a list? I have a list, and I also try to eat before I go because I've learned that if I don't have a list and I don't eat before I go, I'm going to buy everything in the store that looks good. And so I have to have a list, so I keep myself uh, very, very, very discreet there and uh, disciplined and make sure I eat a little something so that I don't eat a whole jar of Pringles on the way home can of Pringles on the way home. But if you go to the grocery store and you say, okay, I'm going to budget. This is all I'm going to spend. And I'm only going to get what's on this list. I'm not going to get those impulse buys. And so when I walk to the counter, I'm going to ignore all the chocolate and all the potato chips and all the buy three, get one free, all that stuff. I'm going to ignore all that, go straight to the register. Amen. And while I'm standing at the register, I'm going to ignore the M&Ms. I'm going to ignore the, the payday candy bars and ignore all that and only get what's on my list. Then not only will you save time, but you'll probably save some calories. Amen. I'm going to budget. I'm going to make things that are home cooked. I'm going to get fresh ingredients. I'm going to eat right. And if I don't budget, uh, then I understand there's going to be issues that happen to my finances later. Amen. And if we learn to live within our means, then those repercussions are going to help us. If you see somebody that has prepared financially through life and they get into their older years and they're, they have a budget and they have some savings, they have some investments and some property, you know one thing, friend, that did not happen by accident. A long time ago, that person sat down and said, where am I at and where do I want to be? Let's have a plan and let's calculate this out and let's take baby steps and let's make sure we do this the right way. It's still fresh in 2020. It's still a new year. We're only about uh, 50 days or so into the new year. It's not too late for some of us to say, you know what? I'm going to get a handle on my finances. This is the year that I'm going to stop using credit cards. This is the year that I'm going to start having a budget. This is the year that I'm going to pay off some unsecured debt. This is the year that I'm going to pay down some things in advance and start cutting some corners and budgeting and making sure that I'm able to live beneath my means. Not right at my means, but below my means. Amen? And, of course, there are repercussions for that. If, for instance, you have a vehicle and you don't maintain that vehicle, you never check the air in the tires, you never change the oil, you never take it in and just get a tune-up. You never run some good gas in it. And you never make sure that when you hear pings and knocks and weird noises that you stop and get it looked like, get it looked at, your car's not going to last very long. Amen? I've known people, they get a brand new car, and they get it, drive it off the lot, and they think, man, this is brand new. It's just going to run like this forever. Well, you know, you go about 10,000 miles or so, and you haven't changed that oil, you're going to start seeing how long it's going to run. A young man here in this church years ago that grew up in this church, and I was trying to help him, and I gave him a new car. Well, it was, it was new to him. It wasn't new to me. It was a Honda, 87 Honda with 300,000 miles on it. But I had driven it back and forth to law school and undergrad school and uh, had really took care of it, changed the oil. You know, something about a Honda, friend, a little Honda four-cylinder, you change the oil on that, and you rotate the tires, and you take care of it. It will run till the rapture takes place. 
I mean, they are just good, solid cars. And I took care of it and I babied it. There wasn't a thing wrong with that car other than it was old and had a lot of miles on it, had new tires on it. But I gave it to this young man, met him at the DMV, titled it over to him, paid the taxes on it, transfer fee. He was probably 18, 17, 18. And I told him, I said, if you'll change the oil in this car, listen to me, change the oil, rotate the tires, and just baby it. When you get to a stoplight and it turns green, don't mash the gas. Just push it easy. Ease into it because that transmission is old. And you want to give it time. When, it, when it's a real cold morning, go out there and crank it up and let it run for about five minutes. Don't just get in it when it's 30 degrees and start it up and take off. You're going to blow the engine. You're going to mess up the gaskets and the seals. And, and so I had this little pep talk with him, and we stood there, and he indicated that he understood. And within 60 days of him having that car, he blew the engine because he didn't change oil. And he, I could hear him revving it, and one day I was out here, and he drove off and squealed his tires, and I thought, tires not going to last very long, and it didn't. There are repercussions for everything you do. If you have a vehicle and you take good care of it, guess what? It's going to last. If you don't take good care of it, it's not going to last. And it always amazes me when teenagers have cars that their parents are buying the tires for, how reckless they are with those tires. And the very first time they have to buy a tire, it's like, oh, take off real easy. What? Don't squeal that tire. What's wrong with you? Yeah, it's expensive, isn't it? Or when mom and daddy's paying for the speeding ticket, how many speeding tickets they get. But the first time they have to pay for a speeding ticket, all of a sudden now, boy, we, speed, we stay on the speed limit, don't we? Any parents? It's getting real quiet in here. Why is it getting so awkward? Any, anybody? All right. Everybody, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, I bailed my kids out a few times. Still bailing Alita out, but, you know, she's in college, so we understand. Thank God she's got a boyfriend. Maybe he can start bailing her out a little bit. Whew. Praise God. God answers prayer. But, you know, I bailed my boys out a couple times, but as soon as they got on their own, I said, okay, now it's your car, your insurance, your car, your gas, your baby. You get a speeding ticket. They don't ever speed now. If I say, all right, you leave me. I'm going to follow. And I'm out on the highway. They go five below the speed limit. It's amazing. Isn't that amazing? It's repercussions repercussions the very first time they get that speeding ticket and it's three hundred fifty dollars plus a lawyer fee and they realize man i might have got here two and a half minutes earlier but was it worth seven hundred dollars i don't think so repercussions amen taking care of your home taking care of things you own there are repercussions for everything that you do let's go to proverbs chapter 26 and I want to read in verse number 27. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse number 27. We'll put it on the screen there. I love this verse. This verse has been one of my favorites for a long time. And I read it a lot because it means so many things. Look at this. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And if you roll a stone, it's going to roll right back on you. There are ramifications for everything that we do in life. If you dig a pit, the writer said, you're going to fall in that same pit that you made. And if you go to messing with a stone with hopes of rolling it on somebody else, it's going to roll right back on you. Amen. The Bible is very clear that if we do the right thing, God will reward us. Going back to Genesis chapter 4, the Lord told Cain, if you do well, then I'm going to be with you. But if you do not well, sin lieth at the door. Praise God. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 8. Right there where we uh, close by Proverbs where we were. Amen. Ecclesiastes 10 and 8. Same thing. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And if you break a hedge, a serpent shall bite you. If you break a hedge, a serpent shall bite you. When I read these verses in tandem and take them in the totality, I can't help but think about what sociologists call the butterfly effect. You've heard me talk about the butterfly 
effect before. And the thesis of that argument is, is that a butterfly flaps its wings and somewhere over in the Middle East, a tsunami happens. And that everything can be traced back to a singular event. Amen. If you think about it in the human perspective, and I don't want to get too deep uh, today, but in a human perspective, sociologists also uh, say, and people that study uh, human nature and that study human relations also say that everybody in the world is connected to somebody else within the fifth degree. We call that the fifth degree. Now, that's very interesting because if you go to LinkedIn and you you sign up to LinkedIn.com, which is a professional website, it's kind of like the Facebook of business, okay? And uh, if you go to LinkedIn and you begin to connect with other people, then there's an algorithm that shows you how that person is connected. And sometimes it'll bring up someone and it'll say three connections or two connections. And what it's letting you know is you're connected to this person already by two or three other people between you. Now, friend, when you think about that, that's amazing because we sit here in Forsyth County, North Carolina, February the 16th, Kernersville, a small town, 22,000 people, a part of a greater county of a half a million or so. And to think that you and I are connected with everybody in this nation within five people, within five people. Somebody in Alaska, if we were to sit down and talk to them, they would know somebody that would know somebody that would know somebody that would know somebody that would know you. Five degrees. That's amazing. The interconnectivity of life. It's the butterfly effect of human nature. Amen. It's the same concept. Let's go to James chapter 1 and verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life. Look at your neighbor and say, not if, but when. James didn't say if he is tried. James said when he is tried. The Bible's very clear that everybody's going to endure temptation. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So let me stop right there. God doesn't tempt people to do evil. The Old Testament says God tempted Abraham. That was a test that God was putting Abraham to. But it wasn't for Abraham to do evil. Okay? So you can't keep a pack of Bud Light in your refrigerator and say, the Lord tempted me the other night to drink beer and I just fell to the temptation. No, no, no. God didn't tempt you to do anything. Satan will tempt you to do evil. God will tempt you to do good. Satan will try to harm you. God will always try to help you. Amen. And so James is very clear that none of us should ever blame God for our temptation. Verse 12, verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So I want you to see the, uh, the repercussions and the ripple effect of what happens here. When lust conceives, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And then in case we forgot it, James said, Do not err, my beloved brethren. So he was saying, just in case you didn't get what I was saying, make sure you understand that there are repercussions for everything you do in life. Amen. When people live constantly at the edge of temptation, falling to that temptation is just a repercussion. And that's why James said, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. If I was to go up here to Stone Mountain State Park, right here in our beautiful state of North Carolina. Has anybody ever been to Stone Mountain State Park? Man, it is gorgeous up there. And some of you have been there, and you've noticed how the, the stone is, is round, but then it gets to a certain point. If you walk it and walk it and walk it, there's almost what I would call the point of no return. You keep walking that stone, and you get to a point where you can't come back. You're going to fall. There is no coming back. And I've said it before, I took my boys camping there, 
And uh, I noticed that there were fences that had been erected by the state park employees, and it would say, danger, big signs, danger, no trespassing. And then there would be another sign, that, just in case you forgot the first one, it would say, do not walk past this point. You ever seen those signs? And then, like, you know, orange markers and yellow exclamation marks and cones everywhere. I mean, they really are trying to prove the point that if you walk past this point, Bad things could happen. Now, while we were there one time, we've been there several times when my kids were younger, but while we were there one time, there were some teenagers playing and they were having a good time and cutting up. And I saw one of the teenage boys walk over to that sign and looked around and his buddies were cheering him on. Yeah, yeah. And he stepped past that sign. And you know what? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. And his friends were cheering him, and he stepped a little bit further, and nothing happened. But you know something? You know why they put that sign where it was? Because they knew 100% of the time, if you stay on this side of the sign, you're going to live. But at this particular mark, when you step past this mark, your chances of survival begin to decrease with every step that you take. And then if you step further and further incrementally, you get to a point where you don't come back. So that's why they drew the line way back here. To be safe. Folks, you might sit in church and think, well, I don't know why you apostolics don't do this and y'all live this way and you don't believe in this. And you don't do that. And you, don't, you don't believe in this, blah, blah, blah. And so many rules, so many rules. You know why? Because there's repercussions to everything you do in life. Repercussions. So what we have to do, what a pastor has to do, is almost like what a parent has to do. A parent might have five kids. I had four kids, and all of them were different. Some of them would tow that line, and some of them would stay away from the line. So you had to draw a line that you knew would protect all four of them. Because you can't have four different rules for four different kids. Parents, you agree with that? It's just not fair. You'd have anarchy in your house if you had four different kids. I mean, I remember as being the oldest. The oldest is always tough, right? I remember being the oldest, and I didn't get a BB gun until I was 12. I thought I was dying. I thought, my God, all my friends had BB guns. And my mom was so scared. Oh, no, you'll put your eye out. You'll shoot somebody else's eye out. Finally, I got a BB gun, and guess what? I never shot anybody's eye out. But you know what? My little brother comes along, Roy. He gets a BB gun when he's nine. And I remember, I remember Brother Derek being 12, got my first BB gun, and Roy goes ahead and gets his. He, he's nine and a half going on 10. And I remember saying, Mom, make him wait two and a half more years. You know what she said? Well, you prove that you can operate one safely, and so we trust him to do the same. Right? I didn't think that was too fair. But Kevin, I was a little upset with that. I was like, you know what? I'm going to shoot his eye out just for that. <laughs> just to prove that he needs to wait a couple more years. My point is this. A parent has to draw a line. A pastor has to draw a line. There are some things in the scriptures that are overarching principles. Okay? Certain things in the Bible that we know we should not do. Then there, there are other things where the pastor for that church, the shepherd for that church, has to say, okay, how does God want me to handle this for my congregation? I'm going to have to draw the line for my congregation. And so the pastor does that. Everybody's not going to be happy with that. But you know what? Everybody's going to live if they listen to that. Because the line drawn is safe enough where nobody's going to die. We could probably be a little more flexible in some things and say, well, let's don't draw the line there. Let's draw it about 15 feet further down the rock. And you know what? We might lose some of our young people. We might lose some of our young couples. And so we have to draw the line and say, let's create a standard that will protect our congregation from repercussions and what scientists call unintended consequences. 
unintended consequences. I'll give you an example. There's a big discussion in the Bible over wine. You've heard me talk about this on December's when we're talking about foot washing and communion. We don't use actual wine for communion. We use fruit of the vine, grape juice, except for the one year where we had a problem. And I have to go ahead and put that out because some of you were fixing to raise your hand and say, excuse me, uh, back in 2007. Okay. I know, I know. I, it was my fault, remember? I know. I'm going to be explaining that for the rest of my life. Okay, now that we've got that off the table. So we teach that we use fruit of the vine, not actual wine. Now, say, well, pastor, would anybody go to hell if they use actual wine at communion? I don't know. But I know this. If we draw the line here and step back and say, just to be safe, we're not going to go past that mark, then nobody will be lost over that. You see the wisdom of that? Folks, it's the same way in your life. There are people that you're going to have to decide, do I want to take a risk in losing my soul and associating with this group, with these people, with that attitude, with that spirit, with the drinking, with the drugging, with the carousing, with the nightlife, just because I'm friends with them and risk losing my soul, or do I draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to be safe. And I'm going to make sure I don't step across that point of no return to where I tumble down the side of the mountain simply because I just couldn't stop. Repercussions. Somebody say amen. I'm going to drill down a little, a little further for you. Sometimes, if you're not careful, your walk with God can be determined by the smallest of things. The smallest of things. We talked about the power of small things a few weeks ago in one of our Sunday services. You're laying in bed on a Sunday morning, and it's cold, and you're not feeling well, and you say, you know what? I'm just not going to go to church today. I don't miss a lot. I'm going to just rest here. You may be right. Some of you don't ever miss church. And I don't think you'd go to hell for missing one service. But what happens is you step into an area that you've never stepped into before. You follow me? What you just did was not a sin, but it's the beginning of a downward trajectory that if it's not really an emergency and you're really so sick you can't even sit up, then the next time is easier. And the next time is easier. And the next time is easier. And before you know it, you're not here. Now, I use that as an example, but there are other things that some of you and, and us and me, myself, we are susceptible to. It may not be that, but there are other things in life. You know where your boundaries are. There are people in this church that used to be hooked on alcohol. And you've heard me when I was teaching on holiness standards. You don't go to restaurants where they serve alcohol at all simply because you know what your weakness is. Is it a sin to go eat at Applebee's? No, I personally don't go sit up at the bar at Applebee's, but I don't have a problem sitting in an Applebee's eating a quesadilla. I'm not going to order an alcoholic beverage because I don't drink. But if I see a waiter pass by with one, I don't think that that's a problem because that doesn't affect me, but it may affect you. And that's why Paul talks about don't be a stumbling block to your brother. Okay, be mindful of the people you go to church with and don't be a stumbling block to them. So from a church perspective, we may not draw the standard at don't eat at, crack, at a cracker, well, Cracker Bell doesn't serve alcohol, don't eat at Applebee's because we understand that's probably a little too further down the path and we need to draw the line. So we draw the line and say no alcohol because that's the safe line that is congruent with the scripture and also congruent with keeping people alive. Some of you, though, have to draw the line even further than that and say, okay, I appreciate that church standard, but I'm going to say even I'm not even going to a restaurant that serves alcohol because I know what my demons are. That makes sense? Same thing with smoking. Some of you, of course, used to smoke, and the smell of a cigarette tempts you. 
I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but the, a smell of a cigarette doesn't tempt me, but it may tempt some of you. And so you have drawn a line that says, I'm not even going to be around people that are smoking if I can help it. Now, if I'm walking down the sidewalk and somebody's smoking, I walk through a cloud of smoke. That's one thing. But I'm not going to go out and hang out with people that say, you mind if I smoke? And they light up. And I smell it. And before you know it, I'm craving one. And then we go down that path. There are repercussions. Folks, we've got, to be, we've got to be mindful of the ripple effect of life. The ripple effect of life. The good news is that you're in the house of God today. That's going to create a positive repercussion. Because coming to God's house always strengthens you. Coming to God's house always helps you. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Not just I was glad we were going to God's house, but David knew when I go to God's house, good things always happen. There's healing in God's house. There's deliverance in God's house. There's strength in God's house. There's strong people in God's house. I get joy when I get around God's people. I get positive influences in my life when I get around God's people. Some of you have come to me and told me, Pastor, I'm glad I came today because I, when I came to church this morning or tonight, I wasn't feeling good, but now I feel like God touched me. You want to know how? Because you came to God's house. There's healing in the house of God. Praise God. Positive repercussions. Some of you are the only one in your family that comes to church. And you get up. And you get ready, and you come to church, and all your family knows they're welcome to come with you if they want to. And you keep coming, and you keep coming, and you're the only one. You walk in here all by yourself, and you come to church. Repercussions. One of these days, I'm speaking through faith right now, word of prophecy. That family member is going to say, hold on, hold on, wait, let me get my coat. And your draw is going to hit the floor. You're going to say, well, you need a ride somewhere? Yeah, I'm going to church with you. What? Well, you, you still want me to come, don't you? Well, sure. And you will see the repercussion of you continuing to be faithful. Continuing to be faithful. Continuing to be faithful. There was a, a man that was unsaved. His wife was in church. She'd been in church 30 years. And every Sunday, she'd stop on her way out. She had a purse, and she had all the little kids, and she'd say, Honey, you coming to church with me? No, baby, I'm not coming today. Okay, well, we love you. And they'd get in the car, and they'd pray on the way for Daddy, pray on the way to church, and he never would come. Finally, 30 years later, he said to her, he asked her to do something with him that she knew we apostolics don't do. And she thought, and it wasn't like anything immoral, but she thought, you know, it's not really a sin. I mean, we don't do it. It's more of a weight than a sin. So she's battling all this in her mind, and she thought, I'm going to go ahead and do that, because if I do, maybe he'll come to church with me. And she did. And then the next Sunday on the way out, she said, Honey, you coming to church? He said, No, I'm never going to church with you. You told me for 30 years you stood for a particular thing. And last Friday night I asked you, and you did it. Don't ever ask me to come to your church. And that woman got in her car and realized the repercussion of one decision. You know why we'd stand for stuff so strongly? Because there are ramifications for letting down. There are ramifications for not preaching truth. There are ramifications for the enemy thinking that we're backing up on our holiness. We're backing up on our doctrine. As long as this preacher's alive, we will always preach. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In water, underneath the water, with the name of Jesus called out over you. As long as I'm alive. And if you ever see me not doing that, you got my permission to go find another church. And you got my permission to declare me incompetent and have me put somewhere because something's going on upstairs. Somebody say amen. Long as this preacher is alive, we will always preach and teach, as we talked about this morning, Sunday morning in our class, that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. We will always teach and preach that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
Amen. We will always teach and preach that apostolics live a separate and distinct lifestyle from the world, which means we don't act the way the world acts. We don't dress the way the world dress. We don't look the way they look. We don't talk like they talk. We don't smell like they smell. We don't eat what they eat. We don't use what they use. We don't go where they go because we're God's people. Amen. Now, we can back down on that. Do it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be dumb enough to get in this pulpit and say, well, from now on, we're no longer going to preach on such and such. I would never do that because some of y'all believe the truth so strongly, you get up and walk out. But what preachers are doing nowadays, instead of saying we are no longer doing that, they just stop preaching it. And for months, the congregation doesn't hear a message on holiness. For months, the congregation doesn't hear a message on the oneness of God. And false doctrine starts creeping into the church. Not because of an active situation, but because of a passive situation. So when you come to church and you hear something preached that you've been hearing your whole life, Sister Faith, you've been in this church your whole life. I remember when you were born, Sister CC. Sister Rachel, remember when you were born? Sister Brooke, I remember right after you were born. How old are you now? So you were two years old when I met you. Sister Amanda, Sister Jessica, they were young ladies, and I could go on down the list. Some of y'all have been sitting here, you've been hearing this stuff for 20 years. You think, oh my God, here's Pastor again. He's got his lollipop out. He's preaching on the oneness of God. You want to know why? Because if I stop, Somebody moves that line. And then if I stop and don't say nothing else, a few more months, they look around and say, oh, well, let's move the line again. For you know it, we don't even look apostolic. For you know it, nobody's getting the Holy Ghost. Nobody's getting baptized. Nobody's getting healed. Nobody's, nobody's being delivered. Nobody's looking apostolic. And you walk in, you think, is this even an apostolic church? Because there are repercussions. We have to stay firm on the doctrine. And when you hear something you've heard preached your whole life, don't roll your eyes and say, here we go again. You need to sit back and say, thank God for the opportunity to get some clarity on something I've heard all my life. I enjoy hearing it one more time. I want to hear the oneness of God one more time. I want to hear why we're apostolic one more time. I want to hear the fact that we've got to get the Holy Ghost one more time. Praise God for truth. Amen. How many of you have ever had baked spaghetti before? Guess what we're serving for lunch today? Baked spaghetti. You think I'm going to turn that down and say, I've already had that before. I had that back in 1985 on September the 13th at 4.32 p.m. And since I've already in, in indulged in that delicacy, I'm never going to eat it again. No way, man. I'm going to go back there and get me some Parmesan cheese, Texas toast, salad, and I'm going to act like it's the first time. And if you sit close to me and you got some left over, I'm going to get yours too. You want to know why? Because it's good stuff. And so is truth. So is doctrine. So is the word. We shouldn't let it get old hat to us. Amen. Thank God for evangelists that come through. Thank God for special speakers. Thank God for people that come through and preach powerful messages that we think, man, I've never heard that before. That is so awesome. But also you should get excited about basic Bible doctrine. Amen. You should get excited about the opportunity to come to hear a Bible study. Just something very basic and elementary. Why? Because that's making sure our lines are drawn right where they need to be drawn. Somebody say amen. amen. Blessed is the man that endureth. James chapter 1. He shall receive a crown of life. Guess what's going to happen to the people that are faithful and can withstand temptation and are caught up in the rapture. The Bible says they're going to receive a crown of life. We're going to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Genesis 4, 7. Brother Marcus, if you'll come. I shouldn't have mentioned baked spaghetti. 
Some of y'all just, you just tuned me out. As soon as I said baked spaghetti, I could see it, Brother Kevin, just whoop. Not you, but you know. It was all over, man. Should have never mentioned it. If thou doest well, God said to Cain, shout, wilt thou not be accepted? And if you doest not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Harry Chapman wrote a song. Some of you that were coming up in the 70s, you remember it. Cats in the cradle, silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, don't know when. We'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. There were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. He was talking before I knew it, and as he grew, he'd say, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. Cats in the cradle. Silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when. We'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time. Then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. Got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. Walked away, but his smile never dimmed. He said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be like him. Cats in the cradle, silver spoon, little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, son, I don't know when. We'll, together, we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. Well, he came home from college just the other day, so much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and said with a smile, what I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? Cats in the cradle, silver spoon, little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. Son, you know we'll have a good time then. Long since retired, my son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle. My kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. Sure, nice talking to you. The cat's in the cradle. Silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. There are repercussions. And the lyrics of that song so powerful they really say it there are repercussions to everything in life every decision dads moms parents husbands wives young married couples every decision that you make young people every decision that you make today there's a ripple in the pond for tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and we have a choice on this Sunday morning. You had a choice, and you made the right decision. You got out of bed. You came to church. You sat here, and you've absorbed the Word of God. And guess what? There's some positive repercussions that are going to happen in your life this week and the rest of your life because you set some things in motion today that are going to come back and bless you tomorrow. Somebody say amen. Let's stand together. Praise God. The Lord's talking to somebody right now. I wonder if you just lift your hands with me. I know we've got lunch prepared, but let's don't be in a rush. Would you just raise your hands with me right now? Close your eyes and let's take a moment and talk to the Lord. If you need prayer today, if you need the Holy Ghost this morning, this altar's open. We'd like for you to feel the liberty to come and find a place to pray. If you need to be baptized in Jesus' name, why don't you come and let me know. Pastor, I want to get baptized this morning in Jesus' name. Father, I'm asking you that every mom, every dad, every husband, every wife, boy and every girl, every young person realize today the ramifications and the repercussions that set in motion 